Hi, I'm Coral Azus for CNN. The United States imports more goods from China than any other nation. Between 18 and 19 percent of the goods brought into America come from China. The Asian country has been the world's largest exporter of goods since 2009, according to Investopedia. It's known as the world's factory. China is able to make things at lower cost than other countries, and that can result in lower prices people have to pay. But the downside is that when there are supply problems in China, like there are now, they can ripple around the world. We've reported on the communist country's strict zero COVID policy. While other nations have moved toward living with the virus, China continues to apply large scale lockdowns and mass testing policies whenever cases are detected. The country says this policy, quote, puts life first and that it's effective at keeping coronavirus from spreading. But critics say it goes too far, that it's hurting that country socially and economically, and that it's time for China to change it. Right now, there's either a full or partial lockdown in more than 30 Chinese cities. As many as 214 million people have been affected. There's no sign China will make any changes, and with strict containment rules in place in cities like Shanghai, which is China's financial center, manufacturing output is only a fraction of what it normally is, and unused factories have been turned into quarantine centers. Despite protests from some Chinese workers, what this means for businesses that are oceans away is that wait times for products are months longer than usual. Companies from Apple to General Electric say supply problems in China are hurting businesses in America, and some small companies that depend on China to make their goods are afraid of going out of business. Prices on Chinese products are expected to rise around the world. Some experts predict that Chinese supply chain problems could get worse this year than they were in 2021, and that businesses may look to manufacture their products in other countries. 10 second trivia. What is the lightest metal on earth? Titanium, lithium, aluminum, or magnesium? Of all the metals, lithium is the lightest. Of all the cars, SUVs, and trucks in America, less than 1% of them are electric. That's according to the Reuters news agency. But the U.S. government says sales of electric and hybrid cars are growing, almost doubling from 308,000 in 2020 to 608,000 in 2021. Like gas power vehicles, they have their pros and cons. Electrics are less polluted to drive than other cars, and you can charge them at home without going to the gas station. But charging stations are generally harder to find, and it takes a lot longer to charge an EV than it does to gas up an internal combustion engine. EVs are quieter and require less maintenance, but they're more expensive to buy and their battery packs are expensive to replace while it's far less likely you'd replace the engine of a gas-powered car. Still, with sales on the rise, one thing electric car makers need is lithium. It's the lightest of the metals and a crucial part of the batteries for computers, smartphones, and electric cars, but mining and refining lithium can threaten the natural environment and contribute to pollution. So there's a trade-off there. 8,000 feet beneath my feet, there's enough lithium to power America's electric car industry into the foreseeable future. There is a treasure potentially worth billions of dollars. He takes us to a remote part of California near the border with Mexico. In a billion dollar project promising to transform this region. Now, what some people are calling California's Lithium Valley is an economic and environmental wasteland but it could be on the cusp of a boom like this area hasn't seen in 60 years. It's not like there was any big secret. It's not like people didn't know there was lithium in the groundwater here before. It just wasn't worth enough to bother getting it out. But now with lithium prices going through the roof, companies that before were just concentrating on geothermal energy are seeing even more potential in the metal that's in the water. Geothermal companies like Energy Source, that has operations in the southern tip of the Salton Sea and is modifying its facilities for lithium extraction. Why is there so much lithium in the ground here? So geologically, this is uh, you know an interesting place. Colorado River has cut canyons in the west. All of that mineral, all of those deposits have, have made their way here. I have heard that there is theoretically at least enough lithium in this area to supply all the electric cars in America for some time. There certainly is a lot of lithium um, 
potential here at the Salton Sea. You could, you could calculate approximately, you know, a little over 100,000 tons per year of lithium, you know, battery products. That's quite a lot and certainly more than the U.S. consumes right at the moment. I think there's a realistic opportunity to, to potentially double that. Geothermal facilities will use a method of extraction where they will both create geothermal power and collect the valuable lithium from the hot brine deep below. This involves drawing the lithium from the brine after it has completed its journey to help produce electricity. It's clean energy making clean energy. And the kind of investment and opportunity that could transform a region that only a half century ago was full of such promise. This is the story of the miracle sea in the desert, the Salton Sea. If you, were, if you came here during the 50s and 60s, you will find most likely people from Hollywood, the luminaries from Southern California coming to uh, boat and uh, playing golf. And only 50 years later, this is what we have. It went from being the Western Riviera to being one of the worst nightmares, envir environmentally and uh, public health-wise. What happened? We started losing water. The water became more saline. There were massive fish die-offs. We have more water being evaporated, leaving more salt behind and other elements. The sea is, is, an, is an example of what is happening uh, pretty much all around the West. While the geothermal companies are ramping up testing and facilities for regular lithium production, automakers from around the country are visiting the area and staking claim. The automaker says it plans to be carbon neutral by 2040. If automakers hope to fulfill their EV ambitions over the next decade, some, like General Motors, are cutting deals with local geothermal companies as a way to ensure their lithium supply chains. Mary Burrow's leadership and more the sustainability side and localising of minerals per the federal administration really advanced that relationship. So, you know, stage one is a 20,000 tonne per year lithium hydroxide facility, which will go to General Motors. And uh, beyond stage one, we're looking at another 100,000 for stage two. And you would then ship that to a battery manufacturer? Yes, so at the moment there's no real sort of uh, the precursor or cathode manufacturers in the United States. So currently that would be the case, which is a bit of a crying shame, I mean, to put it on a truck, put it on a ship, send it to South Korea or China and then send it back as a, as a, as a cathode active material. The opportunity really is the blank canvas out here to, to co-locate those facilities uh, it would make, uh, make commercial sense. And that opportunity is quickly being fulfilled. Already, Italvolt has announced plans to build a massive battery production facility in the valley that could supply batteries for up to 650,000 EVs a year and create possibly 2,500 jobs in the area. What are your fears in terms of if it's not done right? How could it be done wrong? Not being able to provide the benefits, you know, they are, uh, they claim to, or at least, you know, they're promising to provide and the kind of jobs, you know, for the community. Direct and indirect benefits to the Salton Sea. If all the conditions are played correctly, this can be really good for the economy. This can be really good for the region. Nationwide, it can be a, a, a catalyst. If it is done right, it can be really good. Launching a rocket typically takes a lot of fuel. What if instead of blasting off, you were to spin the rocket around and around so fast that you could then fling it towards space? That's the idea behind Spin Launch, a startup company that uses a centrifuge, a sort of high-tech slingshot, to get a rocket up to 5,000 miles per hour and then release it. After it's in the sky is when its engines would fire up and carry it to suborbital space, if this gets off the ground, so to speak, the company hopes it'll be a lower cost launch option. So is this the centrifuge of space travel? When it gets up to speed, will folks one day say, may the centripetal force be with you? Or is it a slingshot in the dark that makes head spin but otherwise fails to catapult changes in Star Trek? It's certainly space food for thought on your launch break. I'm Carl Azus. You, or some of you anyway, are watching from Derby, Vermont. Shout out to North Country Union Junior High School. We will fling another show your way tomorrow.